Hello, it's great to see everybody. Uh, as he said, my name's Ben, Pastor Ben, and today I get to introduce a new series. So Joel gets excited about it for a year, but he can't be here on the first week, so I get the pleasure of opening the Pleasure series, and uh, we're going to be diving into some fun stuff as we get into that. It, it's, it's interesting, because typically when we talk about pleasure in church settings, I feel like we talk about it on the negative side. Hey, we want to beware of earthly pleasures, that they can lead down dangerous roads or the road towards temptation. And today, and in this series, we're going to talk about pleasure as a road to experiencing God, to knowing Him, to, to knowing the beauty and greatness of Him, and, and growing our relationship with Him. And I am so excited to get into this with you. Uh, let's take a look. C.S. Lewis said this. First slide, there we go. Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I, just, I find this a fascinating and powerful quote. He's basically saying like a child playing in the mud is offered a vacation on the beach but doesn't understand the beauty of the vacation and chooses the mud pie over that. And man, I just, I, I wonder what it would be like for us to fully see the pleasure of who God is. So, so, so often when we're faced with temptation, I, I think one of the ways that we talk about standing against temptation is we talk about the consequences. Hey, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. You take this quick pleasure now, but here's what's going to happen after. But let's be honest. Does that way of combating temptation actually work? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just use a simple example. When my wife makes cookies, she'll say to me things like, hey, you know, you don't want to eat too many because you'll probably feel sick. And I'll say this, I'll think to myself, you know what, that may have been true in the past, but I would like to put that theory to the test again. <laughs> Any of you with me? Yeah. Right, but, so what if the road to overcoming temptation is not the road through just here's the consequence, we need to know the consequence, but what if it's towards a greater pleasure? So here's mud pie here, but there's a greater pleasure here. Uh, or, or you could say it this way, have you ever thought about pleasure being the road to avoid temptation. So just as a metaphor, I want to have a little fun with this. Imagine that I've got two plates of food with me. All right, on this hand, I have a plate of food that is that you love and it is very unhealthy. What, uh, and those, those who are in person with me, what would you put on that unhealthy but you love it plate? Pizza? Pizza? <laughs> Bacon? What else? Donuts? Okay, we got donut, pizza, bacon. Bacon, okay, pizza with donuts and bacon. Hey, that's pretty good. That's pretty good and really not great for you. All right, so on this plate, we've got food that is, that you love and it is also healthy for you. What do you put on this plate? And just right up front, kale is not an option. Okay, <laughs> what do you put on this one? Broccoli? No, Next, steak. steak. We did go with steak in the early service, but there's some argument about health. Raspberries, Raspberries. okay. What else? Strawberries. Strawberries. Lamb. Lamb. Ooh. Tapuli. I don't even know how to say it. <laughs> All right, we need another one here. We'll go with lamb chops. Guacamole. Guacamole. All right, so on this plate, we've got healthy and you love it. On this plate, we've got unhealthy, and you love it. So if given, if put in front of you, you might lean towards pizza, you know, I think early service was nachos, nachos, pizza, and, uh, and donuts, whatever's over here, bacon. And, but, but if you fill up on the one that is healthy for you, and you love it first, it's a lot easier to resist the one that's unhealthy for you, right? And so I think the same is true with pleasure. So many times we try to stop by our willpower. Like I'll just, I see the consequence, I won't. But what if being drawn towards something greater is a key to resisting temptation? And, a key, and, and the beauty 
is in the beauty of our king, our God, seeing him for who he is. So there's so many mud pies, thing in, our, mud pies in our world that promise good things, but, but the beauty of God trumps them all. Uh, last week uh, was Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday, and I wasn't able to be here. I was in Dallas uh, with family. My brother was preaching. He gave an awesome message, just like Joel did here, about the resurrection of Jesus, about the power of that, and the church. Like, I'm looking around, and we're going, mm, yes, nodding heads. We're in. Yes, Jesus rose from the dead. That's beautiful. That's powerful. Yes. And then at the end of the service, they announced that there were donuts in the lobby. <laughs> And the church erupted in applause. And there's a kid in front of me going, yes, 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 yes. I'm like, donuts over the resurrection of Jesus? <laughs> one is a mud pie. One is the beauty of our God. And how often do we raise up the donut moment and miss the glory? And so in this series, we're going to talk about the beauty of God in all these different ways. In fact, let's review that one more time. This week, today, I'm going to talk about the beauty of nature. Then next week will be the beauty of friends. And then week three, the beauty of sex. And, and this is kind of fun. Pastor Joel is going to give us a sex talk. <laughs> week four, the beauty of generosity. Week five, the beauty of food. So this is what we'll be diving into and walking through over the next few weeks. So let's get right into it before I walk away from the screen and talk about the beauty of nature. So Revel, uh, or sorry, Romans chapter 1. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Romans 1 tells us that the creation all of the, what the, all that we see, touch, know, that gives glory to God. And, and he says, there's no excuse for not seeing him. Like was, he's everywhere. And I'll tell you, preparing for this message was a challenge. Not because I didn't have enough material, but because you could, there's so much material. You could pick anything and see, just look close enough and be amazed at the beauty of God. Like there are scientists in the world who geek out about everything. Like in my research, there's a scientist who studied the backsides of beetles. Like that's literally what he gets paid to do. Hey, what is that beetles backside up to? How does that, how was that designed? Right? Like you could look at anything up close and just be amazed at the beauty of God. And I know many of you have similar experiences to me where you came to a deeper knowledge of God through science and the study of the world because many of you talked to me after the first service and shared with me your ways of like God did this and I saw his creation in this and it was amazing in this way and and I'm just going to cherry pick a few today and I'm going to try my best to stay within the time we have because there's so much amazing beauty to God's creation he's just incredible so let's start here Picture in your mind the most beautiful place you've been on planet Earth or what you imagine to be the most beautiful place on planet Earth. Uh, Forbes had an article where they did a, used the scientific method to identify the most beautiful place on the planet. They had the 15 most beautiful. And curious if anybody has this one. The number one one was in Canada. Anybody have Canada on their mental list? No, oh, no. Mm -mm. It's, oh, one, all right, it's a place called Peito Lake, and here's a picture of it. That water is blue, neon blue like that, because of the glacial melt, like that's its color, and I can just imagine in, in person, it is just all the more glorious. In this basin, snow-capped mountains in the distance, I mean, it, that picture is amazing. Now, just picture yourself there, or someplace like that that you've been, and just in your imagination, breathe in that beautiful, clean air. Oh, just listen to the wind rustling, the birds. Like there's no man-made noise anywhere to be found. Isn't there something divine about places like that? And, and, and whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, I think humanity attributes d d divine attributes in moments like that. Just think about it. Now, what does the world say? They'll say, Mother Nature this. They'll say, The intent of the universe. They'll say, 
the evolutionary design, taking a- divine attributes and attributing them to, to natural phenomena because they, they don't see God in it. And, and his word, Romans says, we, we see the divine, we see God Almighty, our creator, be in awe. Now, have you ever stood on one of those mountains at night when the sky is clear and seen the stars at night? So gorgeous. You don't even need amplification. And you can see the line of the Milky Way and how it goes out. And you can just uh, amazing beauty. See, the mountains declare the glory of God, the stars declare the glory of God. Here's what Scripture says. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children. This is Psalm 8. And infants, by the way, that word infants means children in the womb. So through the praise of children and unborn children, unborn babies, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. The author of the psalm is looking at the sky above and just being in awe of God. You are so great. Who are we in comparison to your magnificence? So uh, in the 70s, NASA sent a probe out called Voyager 1. And Voyager 1, as it was leaving our solar system, turned around. it took one last snapshot looking back towards Earth. And it's this image uh, called the pale blue dot. Uh, The arrow was not in the original image, just to be clear. (laughs) But that little dot there, that's Earth. Just as it's leaving our solar system, that's Earth. Everything that you know, all of human existence has happened on that tiny little dot in the midst of the massive cosmos. And when you think about all that God has done, how massive that is, and the fact that he knows you intimately. Even the very hairs on your head are counted, or not on your head are counted, (laughs) right? He knows you. That's just so humbling. And I have to stop here and say, we, we don't hear a lot of messages that talk about nature and faith. And I, th- I wish we would hear more because in our culture today, we've got this really mixed up idea that faith and science are at odds with each other. And they are not. Faith and, faith and science are cooperative with each other. In fact, they are both searching for the same thing, the truth. And for me, science has been such a road to seeing the deeper things of Jesus and so many others. Uh, in my research here, I ran into scientist after scientist who, as they dug into whatever their area of field was, were amazed at the complexity and the beauty and the engineering behind it and said, there must be an engineer. And then you'll hear people say, well, maybe it was all these different things, but for many of them, that engineer pointed them to God Almighty and on their road to knowing Jesus as Savior. And that's the road for me. You see the design, you glorify the designer. And so many things in science give great weight and evidence to the beauty and word of God Almighty, not just his existence, but his activity in our world. So so here's just one, and this is a pretty big one. Uh, There was an atheist a number of years ago who was looking at the origin of life, and he did the calculation of, with all the complexities of of creation and of, of the world and all of life as we know it, And it was like, for this to have happened over a series of chances, what is the mathematical equation for that to have happened? And he came up with this number that it would be the chance of 1 in 10 billion to the 123rd power. So start with a 10 billion, add 123 zeros after it. And it's basically saying, statistically, impossible. And that number is so big, it's, it's hard to even imagine. So I heard one person say it this way, uh, you have a better chance of winning the lottery 10,000 times in a row and getting struck by lighten, lightning every time you pick up the ticket than you do of, that, of, of all of this just happening by chance. There's a creator, a designer, or originator and creation gives glory to his name. And I love this too, and this is just a small one. 
But when you read something in the scriptures written hundreds or thousands of years ago, and then we discover something in science, and you're like, oh, well, that, those match up. So, so here's one of them uh, about the stars, Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. What? The stars in the sky pour forth speech. And night after night they reveal knowledge. Like, Why would you talk about stars as if they're talking? But you know what we found? Stars make sound. All of them. There's even, there's a whole science of people studying what they call the orchestra of the, so, the star, the symphony of the stars. Somebody's recorded that and then, and then it's out of our hearing range, so then uh, shifted it so that it's in our hearing range and made literally a video where you can listen to the sound of the stars. And Psalm 19 says that sound is just giving glory to God. The stars echoing who he is. So the mountains declare his praise. The stars declare his praise, and nature declares his praise. Job 12, but ask the animals, they'll teach you, or the birds in the sky, they'll tell you. Speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Study any of these, and let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hands is the life of every creature and the breath of of all mankind. He's, he's basically saying, study it, dive in, look, and you will see God's hand is in everything. And this is where, this is a dangerous part of the message for me because I got a long list of, isn't that cool about nature things? Uh, I was talking about this uh, with uh, Jim Trout, Troutfetter, and he gave like a whole list of things to me, and we have these conversations often. One of them is this, do you ever wonder what bees do in the winter? I never did until he showed me, and then I was like, wow, that's amazing. Bees in the winter huddle around the queen bee, and they buzz, so to keep her warm. And a queen bee will stay between 70 and 90 degrees all winter long. They'll eat that honey they stored up and keep the queen bee warm the whole winter. Isn't that cool? I mean, wow. Right? That gives glory to God, his incredible design. Or, or you, get to the, you get to the beetle. I won't talk about the beetle backside anymore. We'll leave that one. But uh, the dragonfly, stu- this is the other thing that's happening is, is we're making scientific breakthroughs. Many of them are just from studying nature, what God has already designed. So there's a whole TED Talk I heard of a woman who's just studying the dragonfly, looking for the part in their tiny little brain that helps them to target their prey because they have an incredibly efficient targeting system. Wow, do you know that your brain runs on the power equivalent to a 20-watt light bulb. That might not mean much to you, but they're studying your brain. Well, maybe not yours directly, but they're studying human brains to try and figure out how to create computers that can run for weeks, months, or years because they're so efficient. We've been working humanity's collective knowledge, and the best we can do is this Apple Watch might last till Wednesday. But they, God, God's design is so amazing and intricate. I have two sons in college right now who are studying uh, engineering and a daughter stu- studying biomedical science. So I talk to my kids and I ask them, hey, what, 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 do you, what are you learning that speaks to God's amazing design? And uh, my kids, so aerospace engineer, he said, you know, when you're in a plane, you've got the wings serve a function and the engines serve a function of thrust. He said, birds, just the smallest bird, it does both functions in those little wings in a more efficient way than we have been able to figure out how to do. Isn't that incredible? Uh, they, They also shared this with me, that in the human body is every type of joint that you will find anywhere in engineering. So all the engineering and building, every type of joint that we use already exists in the human body. Maybe not exactly the same use, but the same type. Incredibly, you are a bio-engineered miracle. Work of God. Unbelievable. Amazing. So, so hear me. The, the mountains declare the glory of God. The stars declare the ma- glory of God. Nature declares the glory of God. And you declare the glory of God. 
Would you look at the person next to you and tell them, you declare the glory of God. Oh, say it like you mean it. You do. You might, you might not realize it, but just who you are declares. So I, I told you, like, scientists, they get to geek out about all sorts of things. I watched a whole hour of a scientist who is a follower of God who uh, the whole time all he did was geek out about the bones in the foot and the bones in the hand. Not even the whole system, just the skeletal bones for an hour. This guy, he, he built joints that are on satellites floating around the earth right now. And he's like, we cannot figure out how to do anything nearly as efficient and compact as what is in your ankle and in your hand right now. I mean, so, so just as an example, I said I could use anything. So I want to use something that most of us use every day, your hand. So go ahead and put your hand out right in front of your face. Yep. Maybe just move it like this. Yeah, wiggle those fingers. Stick them in your neighbor's face. Yeah, good. Very good. Yeah. You can remove them now. Yes. You just doing that is an incredibly complex and amazing move of bioengineering. In your hand are 27 bones, each one with a unique purpose. Each one has, it has purpose and reason. 26 muscles from your forearm into your hand help move them all. Hundreds of ligaments connecting them all together, working through the, in the carpal tunnel and the nerve systems that are, that are in there all connect. Thousands of nerves going all the way down. Look at your fingers. Look at those fingerprints you got. And you get your reading glasses out if you need to. Those fingerprints on your fingers are unique to you, and they serve some incredible functions. One, they, they create some grip, so when you grab things, they have a little bit of grip and friction. But two, as all those nerve endings in, in your fingers, like it creates those little ridges, just gives you that much more feel. So when you touch and feel something, you get more sensitivity. It's incredible. Just incredible. And then, then your fingernails, you know, your fingernails, they, they serve a function of, of pressing against. So when you grab something, it's easier because you've got, you've got this hard surface that's, that's coming against it. And then look at your hand again and see those lines on your hand? Those do not tell your future. <laughs> but you know what they do do? Do do? <laughs> Gosh. Let's reword that one. God gave you those lines while you were in the womb. And they connect the, your, your tissue right through the adipose, which is kind of the, the, you know, the squishy parts, so that when you bunch your hand up like this, the skin doesn't poof out, but stays in And when you grip things. Isn't that incredible? That, those lines don't tell your future, but they tell you you've got an incredibly awesome designer God. It's amazing. And then, not only that, but you've got a circulatory system that's fueling that hand at all times. So um, my daughter, years and years ago, had a, we had a little oxygen breathing issue, and we got into the hospital, and they put a little thing on her finger. You ever seen them do that with the oxygen sensor? And it's on the very tip of the finger. And they put, she had that on. It said her oxygen was low. So then they put the oxygen mask on her, and immediately... The numbers went up. Now, just think about what's happening. And the tip of her finger, she's getting oxygen in here. It's going into her lungs. Her lungs are then transferring that, that oxygen into her heart. Her heart is pumping it out through her body. And almost immediately, it's bringing energy to the very tip of her finger. And that's happening to all of us at every moment right now. It's incredible. You just look at your hand and be like, Wow. And why did I use our hands? Because, because with this hand, it, you're going you're gonna to hold it up later with communion. Hold it up to the glory of God. When you worship, just think, wow. Like this complex, amazing bioengineering, God did that. Yeah, so go ahead, just put your hands up. Yes, give glory to him. And now we're going to talk about armpit smells. <laughs> and there's a whole science behind that. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that, but you could. You could. Some scientists are probably being st paid to study it right now, guaranteed. But isn't that amazing? You give glory to God. And that's just one 
part of the incredible system. Somebody sh shared with me after the first service that they worked at Medtronic and they did all this work to create this one device that went into your body that helped your heart. And they literally, as they were pre presented this device, were told this device can serve two, has two sensors. They said your heart has over a million sensors that are constantly evaluating as things are happening. This one serves two of those functions. Wow. God, you are an incredible designer. See your hand in everything. Your very body gives glory to God. But wait, there's more. Check this out. Colossians 1. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, things visible like our hands, and invisible. Invisible! Invisible things, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. What is this saying? It's saying two things. First of all, there's a whole angelic realm. We can't, we don't see. God created more than we can even imagine. And think about things like gravity. You can't see it. It's forces on it. We don't even understand it. Or, or quantum mechanics. I, mean, I challenge you, just go look up quantum mechanics for dummies later. And tell me if you even understand that. Because I tried reading it, and I'm like, I can't even preach this, because I don't even, what? That was the dummy version. It's so incredibly complex and beyond what we can see, and it just shows how, like, God, if God didn't just create all this that we look at and go, wow, he created even more. And how much more is there yet for us to discover? I mean, what is the future going to be like as we discover more and more and more of God's creation? It's amazing. And listen to this. There's more. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What is this saying? It's telling us this, this amazing world with all its beauty, where all the things we just wow in awe, in awe of God, this is the broken version. The, what it's saying is there's better and more to come and creation itself groans for that. Can't wait for that. We're part of creation. We groan for that. Uh, years ago, uh, homeschoolers, we, we did the whole monarch butterfly thing. I don't know if anybody's done this. You go find the eggs on, on the um, milkweed plant, and you take the milkweed in, and this little egg hatches, and you get this tiny little caterpillar, and you watch it just eat milkweed, only milkweed. I, this is amazing in itself, that milkweed through the process of being eaten by a caterpillar, then transforms into a monarch. Like that's, it's just, it's mind-boggling to me. Maybe I geek out on this stuff. Maybe you don't. But we watch this whole process and the, this little caterpillar becomes a plump caterpillar and it does the J and then it sheds its skin and it turns into a chrysalis. And then that chrysalis opens up and then the butterfly shakes out its wings. And then we're so excited. We watched this for all this time. We take out the butterfly as a whole family and we're saying God's creation isn't as amazing. Let's release this butterfly. And then a bird swooped in and just whoop. <laughs> and my kids were like, ah. <laughs> and we immediately went from God's creation is beautiful and this is the broken version. <laughs> and it is. And our, even our own bodies cry out. Like the, the older we get, the more likely a good sneeze is going to put us out of commission for a week, right? <laughs> it's just true. And what is that telling us? Our bodies are saying we're groaning for that body that will be renewed, restored. There's more to come. And listen, there's so much more. Look at what it says this is going to be like. You can go to the next one, Isaiah 65. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. No more birds taking butterflies out of the air. The lion will eat straw like the ox, and the dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, says the Lord. This restored, beautiful creation is going to be at peace. Oh, doesn't your heart ache to know that? Wow. In the 60s, there was a lion named Little Tyke that would not eat meat. It was a vegetarian lion. 
And it was the most peaceful line. We got a picture of her right here. There's little tyke. And look at little tyke with a little kitten tucked between her, if you didn't see that. And uh, little tyke also, there's a picture of little tyke with a lamb just hanging out. We couldn't get the copyright for that one, so we couldn't share that with you. But you can also look that up if you want to. But little tyke was a vegetarian lion and, and the friend of all other animals. And isn't, it's just like a little glimpse of what heaven will be like with peace. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Check this out. Next verse, Revelation 21. He, Jesus, who is seated on the throne, said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus tells us he's not done creating. He's not done that his resurrection from the dead means that we're a part of this new creation. That beautiful, like this, when we are in awe of the beauty of this world, imagine what's to come. He's making it new. And I just, I want to tie it all together with this. Uh, a few years ago, Pastor Ernest J. Raja, he's one of the Westwood's partner churches who meets over at the Bush Lake campus. He and his family came over to our house and his little daughter, just the cutest little girl, our house is nothing special, but when she walked in the door, she just looked around and she goes, wow. And then she went into the bathroom and goes, wow. And then she went in the kitchen. What? Like she just kept saying it. Wow. It's like the cutest little girl voice wowed by everything that she saw. And I just think, man, isn't that how we should be with God's creation and his beauty? Wow, wow, look at that hand. Wow, Lord, honor to you. Everything gives you glory. And this isn't even the best version. Wow, honor and glory to you, Jesus. So let's pray. Jesus, wow. May we be wowed by you by your creation in all its glory, all its complexity, all its intentionality. May, Lord, the, from the smallest things to the biggest, from the cosmos to the molecular, may we just see the beauty of your creation, be, be drawn to the pleasure that comes from delighting in you and your creation, Lord Jesus. We pray all this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen.